Hello, I'm Matt Ryan. Welcome to Script to Screen. Uh, we are so glad to have our very special guest that is direct to films like Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Can You Ever Forgive Me, and recently can be seen the international Netflix hit The Queen's Gambit, playing the complex mother character of Alma. Today here we're talking about a directorial feature debut, director Diary of a Teenage Girl, so please welcome to virtual UCSB Polytheater stage, writer-director Mariel Heller. Hi. 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 Thanks so much for coming. All right, so our series is called Script to Screen. But for Diary Teenage Girl, it really could be called Diary to Novel to Comic Book to Script to Screen, uh, a very windy, winding path. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. What was it about the book that emotionally resonated with you and initially made you want to turn to a stage play? So I read the book, which is really a graphic novel, but it's sort of a graphic novel hybrid um, written like a diary with graphic novel elements. And I, I read it not because I was looking to, for something to adapt, but it was just, my sister loved the book, gave it to me as a gift for Christmas. And at the time I was acting in theater mostly. And, um, and I was really frustrated with the parts I was playing. I was feeling like young women were just never represented fully. And I never felt like we had agency and the parts I was playing felt really vapid. And this book was so, it was just like a light bulb went off. It was so raw. It was so real. It felt like, um, oh my God, this is what boys must have felt when they read Catcher in the Rye. Like, this is me. This, I feel, even though it wasn't my story and I was different in so many ways from the, the main character, I just felt, I felt seen as corny as that now in our kind of current day is to say, because we talk about representation so much, but I felt seen by the book and I felt like, um, it was something that I never had, I realized how rare that was for books and movies for me to feel like, oh, this is about me. Um, so I was really moved by it. And at the time, because I was really working in theater, I approached the author and her agents to try and get them to let me make it into a play first. And they said no to me a lot of times for months and months because I had never done anything like that before. I wasn't even a writer. I was really an actor who just wanted to, I wanted, I knew I wanted to write and this thing just spoke to me in such a way. And I, I hounded them. I sent pictures of myself and my cats to the author and I hounded her agent and brought cookies to her office. And I just like, wouldn't take no for an answer because it, I, I had never been so moved by a, a piece of material before. I had never felt so clear about what I wanted to do. Um, so I just couldn't take no for an answer. And you played Minnie on stage. Mm -hmm. how, was, how was that? Part of the impetus of wanting to adapt the book was I was like, I want to play a part that's this good. There's no part, you know, I haven't gotten a good part that feels this real in so long. And, and then it became something so much more because it was also like, I want to do right by this character and figure out how to tell her story in a way, in another medium other than the book. Uh, now, this theater stage is, is an ideal place to explore stories uh, that Hollywood does not all have a long history of supporting, like no. a real look at the uh, experience of a sexual awakening desires in a teenage girl. Uh, how did developing it through the Sundance Institute help you create the script in a way that would be true to the story that you want to tell? So after I made it into a play and we did the play and we did the play in New York and had a great run and it was the most satisfying creative experience I'd ever had. But it ended and I realized I wasn't done with the story. And at the time I had started, I had started writing screenplays with a writing partner and I had, I had liked writing. I had, through the process of adapting the book into the play, which had taken a long time and many years, I, I really liked the process of writing. And so I had started writing screenplays and I was thinking a lot about screenplay formats and just sort of how screenplays work and the visual elements and the things that I couldn't do on stage that maybe I could do with a screenplay. And um, I started writing it and uh, Anne Carey, who's a producer who at the time I had a relationship with, just we had a kind of loose relationship and she had seen the play. She said, no one's gonna wanna make this movie. Like this is really hard to make, but you should apply to the Sundance Labs because maybe if you got the support of it someplace like that, you would people would take you a little more seriously, kind of. And so 
I partially applied to the Sundance Labs, like hoping they could help me figure out how to make what seemed like an unmakeable movie, sort of. Um, and the process, the the process of being at the labs and going through that was so helpful in my whole creative process. I mean, looking back between the play and the movie, I think I wrote 85 drafts of the project I realized over I, six or eight years. Um, I constantly rewrote I and I constantly rewrote the play to the point where we performed it after that took four years and then the movie took like another four years and um, and there was something about going through the labs that really helped me solidify what I really wanted the movie to be in a very clear way and um, there's something about getting so much feedback it's all smart feedback but sometimes it it contradicts itself. So somebody will say, oh, you know what scene I loved this scene? Or someone will say, I just didn't like that scene, but I love this scene. And they're both smart writers who you respect and you think, oh, wow, this is the nature of feedback. You can get contradicting feedback from two really smart people that made me realize like, okay, now I have to get very clear about what I actually feel about this script. Now, I guess the first challenge is uh, the Minnie character. In the book, Minnie's unconventional and bold character has no filter and no qualms of taking charge of her own sexuality and desires. How did you approach like adapting the mini character from the book into what you wanted to be for the scripted character? Her voice was the clearest part of the book to me and the part that I felt like I had to find a way to be really truthful to. I felt like, she, I felt like I owed it to her. I had like her as my guide, guidepost and it was the form that needed to change around her truth. And so, throughout the writing of the movie, it was always about kind of clicking back into what that truth was that I had so connected to when I read the book that was based on Phoebe's life, Phoebe Gleckner, who wrote the book, who is an incredible artist. And the story was really her story that I was so moved by. So it was about, it was about tr knowing that I could shift everything within the story, I could shift the plot elements, I could change the story, I could change the form in which the story was being told, but somewhere I had to be true to the emotional truth of this character and her inner strength and her quirks and everything that made her tick and the ways that she was so interesting to me and didn't pull punches and was somebody who was unapologetically real and herself and curious and curious about bodies and curious about the world and didn't pull back from asking hard questions and didn't apologize. You know, I think part of what I always felt turned off by about teenage girls and the way they were depicted and things is like, you were always supposed to apologize for everything. And she was this character who just wasn't apologizing. She was who she was and she, she wasn't jaded, you know, some, there, she just that she was the movie everything about the movie was based on who she was and the truthfulness behind her and her earnestness and so um that was my guiding light that was like the guiding light for the writing of the movie and anytime I felt lost I just tried to connect back to her truth and the actress Belle who I worked with who played Minnie she and I would have conversations where we would be like because we both felt so connected to this character and like we knew what that felt like we would be like is this real is this what it felt like we would like ch check each other to kind of try to reconnect to what that feeling of being 15 and feeling so alone what what is that and um that that always became the guiding light not not storytelling techniques not whatever script things or hitting certain marks or page numbers it was always just like this character. Now you mentioned Belle, so what was it about Belle that made you know that she was the right person to play Minnie? I auditioned hundreds of girls. Um, I had this feeling that, I mean, I knew it was gonna be a really hard part to cast, but Belle was weirdly one of the first, first girls who auditioned. And she sent in a tape, she's English, she was in London and she was doing an American accent and it was perfect. And at the end of her tape, she went into her normal British accent and she basically 
broke the fourth wall and was like, I just have to tell you, I've never connected to a script like this in my whole life. This means more to me than anything I've ever read. It was so real. And I don't know that that would always work for an actor, but the way she did it, it just didn't feel like a gimmick. It felt really like she meant it. Um, and her audition was so good. She was so vulnerable. She was not self-conscious. There was nothing about her performance that was self-conscious and I was having this issue. I feel like this is sort of a bad thing to say, but like I was having this issue with American actors where I was like, there's something about our culture today or whatever these 21 year old actresses I'm auditioning are growing up watching that's making them incredibly self-conscious or maybe it's like the YouTube culture or something, but like they were all kind of aware of how they moved and how they would look with the camera and they weren't letting themselves just be seen. And Belle like let herself be seen in this really intimate, deep way. It didn't feel contrived or controlled. Um, so her audition was incredible, but I didn't think I could have found my girl so fast. So I kept auditioning <laughs> and I auditioned hundreds of more people and I just kept comparing everyone to her until I was like, okay, it's clearly her. Like, why am I torturing myself? I just, for some reason, thought it had to take a long time. And then um, and then I, I had cast Alexander Skarsgård, so I brought them together. And then once I saw them together and the three of us got to work together in a room for a couple hours on scenes, I was like, this is it. This is perfect. Yeah, it's interesting because in the book, uh, I, I, found, I found Monroe a little more unsettling in the book than actually. Yeah. Uh, how did you approach Alexander's with working with him? Because you, I don't know to cover because he had such a complicated, dicey role. Or well, was. I mean, I was aware that in the book, I mean, it's an abusive relationship. There's no doubt about it, and he is a very guy. And, um, but I'm also aware that when you watch something visually in a movie it's more upsetting than in a book. So in a, just at least for me, you know, watching something and having a visual image, it's a little bit more damning. So there were certain things that I felt like we had to kind of toe the line on in order for you as an audience member to not totally tune out or turn off or be like, oh, it's too much. I can't watch this. This is too much. I want to walk away. I never wanted the audience to feel tortured because my experience of the book was not feeling tortured. My experience of reading the book was, ooh, I feel excited by this. I feel sort of turned on by this. Oh, it's so gross. Why did I feel that way? Oh no. Oh, what's going to happen? You know, I wanted that emotional involvement that I had in reading the book with the movie. So I was aware if we showed him in too dark of a light that you would just as an audience member feel like, I'm turning this off. This is too much. So finding an actor who didn't judge the character was really important. I mean, that's always important. If you are casting a bad guy or a villain character, they have to connect to the humanness of that character. They have to find something that they, the actor has to find something that they love about that person. And um, Alex really connected in some interesting ways even though he could see Monroe for all of his faults he didn't judge him and um that was crucial because in order for someone to truly inhabit someone that complex they have to not judge them and I think he did truthfully the most heavy lifting in the movie because if that hadn't worked if you hadn't believed him as a full person the movie never would have worked uh, the story takes place in 1970 San Francisco. How do you think that atmosphere helped you influence your unconventional story? Oh, I mean, it couldn't have been a movie not set in 1976. And I said that the whole time we were making it because there were times when people said like, you know, it'd be a lot cheaper if we set it present day. And I'm like, no, we can't set it present day. It wouldn't be the same story so much of the culture of what Minnie was dealing with was the 70s and and the Bay Area. And I'm from the Bay Area and there's a really specific culture in the Bay Area that I was trying to capture, which is this feeling of open-mindedness being the highest virtue and that 
it's so much better to explore than to be a square sort of. Um, and, and that's a, a value that we all grew up with in the Bay Area. It was like all of us who were kind of children of hippies. Um, there were a lot of lines blurred with a lot of people in terms of parent and kid and like kind of trying to break down what authority meant. Everybody was smoking weed with their parents. Like what happens when that happens, when those kind of traditional structures get broken down? And that's a scenario where this type of story would happen, where Minnie would end up sleeping with her mother's boyfriend. Like, and it wouldn't, and it would feel a little bit fuzzy throughout and that the lines were so blurry. Um, so for me, it was always about trying to really, trying to really expose what that culture is in a deeper way and how that really affects everybody and, and how that time period also affects everybody. I read an article when I was researching the movie that was saying, it was talking about the Patty Hearst trial, which I tried to incorporate into my script, which hadn't been in the book, but I realized it was happening in 1976 in San Francisco. And um, somebody had hypothesized that if the Patty Hearst trial had happened 10 years earlier in 1966, uh, she would have been let off because everyone would have said, this was society's problem. We didn't take care of her. This poor girl was a victim. If it had taken place 10 years later in 1986, it would have been like, she's responsible for herself. Why didn't she get out of there and run? If she was a victim of kidnapping, she should have gotten out of there. She should have pulled herself up by her bootstraps and gotten herself out of there. And in 1976, we were like right in between these two realities of like personal responsibility versus societal responsibility. And I found that to be a kind of helpful um, thesis about kind of the era that I was trying to capture in this moment of kind of in between. Uh, it's interesting because you brought the mom character in your script, you have Charlotte, hip woman of 34 who wishes she was 25. Charlotte's still beautiful though she wears mistakes on her body and she uh, sips a gin and tonic. Great description introduce her. We don't often see mother characters in mainstream Hollywood like this, like well, the three dimensional. How did you approach a character while writing the script to ensure her three dimensionality would not be lost completely in service to her daughter's character? She was the character who I had to figure out the most in writing the script, you know, and get, I think she was the character who I brought my own judgment to before I started writing and I had to find a way to love her. Um, so a lot of that for me was figuring out how she could have gotten to where she was, you know, um, and part, a lot of it was invented because uh, I didn't dig into Phoebe's real mom and it wasn't necessarily just based on her. It was also, we took creative license in certain ways, but kind of trying to create this character where you were like, the story that I kind of created about her was that she had been born in a more kind of conventional family and had left that family and uh, was kind of making her way in San Francisco, had gotten married and pregnant really young to Minnie's dad. Um, which that part was true. And some of it was based on stuff from the book and things I knew, and then we kind of expounded upon it. But um, what that she was really 15 herself, you know, that she had never really found herself and she was just, she was in the exact same place in her life as Minnie was. She was exploring herself and trying to find herself and having a coming of age of her own. And that because she got pregnant so young and had become a mother so young, she sort of lost her youth. And um, I mean, we talked about all three main characters, Monroe, Minnie, and Charlotte, all being sort of 15, um, at least in their emotional development. Um, but it gave me a lot more empathy for Charlotte to really think about how much she had tried to shed from her previous life to come to San Francisco and kind of be this certain type of person and all these things she was fighting at the same time. And then kind of exploring her ideas about beauty and femininity and what it meant to be a woman at the time and how she kind of has this programmed 
patriarchy in her head that's telling her, you know, your your assets are what matter, is your beauty and your looks and your body. And that she's feeding that to Minnie almost despite herself, realizing like, I want to be a feminist and give her these other lessons, but also like, listen, your power is in your body and um, and realizing that in this funny way, she was the antagonist of the movie. She represented where Minnie could go in the worst case scenario, that she, she actually represented the sort of, one of our advisors at the Sundance Labs, Michael Arndt, it explains it as the antagonist's aria, that the antagonist of a film has to give their perspective and they have to give it in a really compelling way. Um, and you have to, while they say it, almost go with it, you believe it. So I thought of that scene where she says, you know, you have a kind of a power, you just don't know it yet. And she kind of pushes Minnie to entangle her power with men in that way and feel like her um, her self-worth is going to be wrapped up into whether men are looking at her that that was her antagonist's aria and that we were watching that to understand one way Minnie could go but then she rejects it and then at the end Minnie has this speech when they're in the club where she says maybe nobody will ever love me and maybe that doesn't matter. Um, maybe it's about loving yourself. And that was always meant to be in direct reflection to this an antagonist aria that Charlotte gave. Uh, you and I, before we started the keynote, you and I talked a little about opening. So let's talk a little about the opening of your film. Uh, we get into uh, we get introduced to Minnie's bold fascination with sex. I claim I just had sex, as well mm -hmm. as the free flowing social climate of the seventies, with which includes people smoking pot, going topless at a picnic, and jugglers. Uh, how did you decide to start the film off this way? So when I was at the Sundance Lab, Scott Frank uh, led us in a seminar kind of workshop about openings. And it made me rethink how I was going to open the film. One thing I was really aware of was that when I, when I did the play of Diary, I realized I had to give the audience permission to laugh really early. That a movie about a 15 year old girl having sex with her mother's boyfriend doesn't make people think they're gonna go, they're gonna be able to laugh. So they would sit down in the theater and be really serious. And I had to like show them right away, like, no, no, this is gonna be funny. You can laugh at this. And so I was really aware that like, I needed that opening scene of the movie to be something that said like, there's a silliness to this. She's like got a swagger and a thing about her and something that's gonna make you feel like she's in charge and and you're gonna remember what it felt like to be 15. So I, after this Sundance Lab workshop, I thought a lot about exactly that, the how do I give the audience a sense of ease about what she's going through. How do I explain? She's excited about this. She had sex and she's stoked. Um, so I decided to start it the moment after it had begun and then to jump back in time and catch back up. So that was a very conscious choice to be like, I want you to know right away she's excited about what's coming before the movie even starts you'll know she was really happy when this happened. And then that can help frame for you everything you're watching that comes after to kind of make you feel a little bit better about it, but also to just kind of give it a certain context where you're in her head. You're not judging it from an outside perspective going, oh no, this is wrong. She thinks it's great in that moment. So you're watching it through her eyes. So, and then I was like, I wanna set up the era within this one scene. I wanna set up that she's in control and that she thinks this is great and that she had sex recently. And I want you to understand she's an artist. So these were all the th pieces I was trying to put together in the opening scene. And so I decided to set it in the park and to have her walking around and seeing people smoking weed and, and to see that she's thinking about sex all the time. So I sent this jogger down who had big bouncing boobs and she imagined stars on her boobs. And I introduced, oh, I wanted to introduce the animation. There were so many things I wanted to do in the course of this opening scene that felt like a huge task. 
and yeah, my dad is in the scene juggling. My dad was a juggler in the Bay Area back in the day. And so I was just trying to give it that Bay Area truthfulness too, um, with all of all of those details. But uh, it was a really insane shoot, what we pulled off there too. We also were not supposed to have anybody naked. And then we had somebody like just topless in the park and we almost got shut down for that. We were doing things kind of by the seat of our pants with very little money and just kind of making it work. There's also people in that scene who were just in the park who we could not clear out just walking around. So it sounds like a student film production that we deal with all the time here in our film department. It felt a lot like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you do set up the tone and the humor. Now the important setup, the next setup scene is- Oh wait, there's one more thing I need to say about the opening scene, sorry. The first line is not, I just had sex. It's, I had sex today. The first time I wrote it, I wrote it as I just had sex, but my husband is a comedy writer for SNL and he had a song called I Just Had Sex that had come out like that year. And I realized I couldn't have the opening line of the movie be like a quote from the Lonely Island, I just had sex. So it's, I had sex today. <laughs> All right, so the next setup is we have the Minnie Monroe's relationships, uh, really the bar scene, which was yeah. kind of chaotic, but you're also setting up the power dynamic and the relationship. So how did you- That's work the first that? scene of the movie, the first scene we filmed of the movie. Oh my God, that's, that's a lot of pressure on the actors as your first scene. So what was the approach of work? How did you want to work with those two? Like we have to, we have to get this scene right. We rehearsed. So I like rehearsing because I come from theater and I like, I don't really understand how people don't rehearse. Um, but so we rehearsed for a week so that we could really hit the ground running. So that was a scene we talked through in great depth. And when, when we rehearsed, we're not like on our feet rehearsing, but we're sitting around a table with our scripts, reading through the scene, saying it out loud, hearing the words come out of their mouths, feeling which words are getting stuck, which words are feeling right. And then talking it through, like, what are the moments? What are the moments she reaches out, then she pulls back, he reaches out, he pulls back. What's the architecture of the scene for emotionally? How do you, how do we get to this moment where she bites his finger and it's sort of everything changes. Um, and obviously it's like, a, it's a really fun scene because everything is all in the subtext. Uh, it was a hard scene to write and a fun scene to figure out. And then we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. And then the first day we went in to film it and it just went so well. And the moment we filmed that scene, I just thought, oh my God, this movie's gonna work. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Cause it just was so hinging on their chemistry and believing all the complexities underneath this relationship and everything that came to that moment. So and was it kind of a coincidence started. that you decided to shoot that scene first? Or it was it really just a, it just had to happen based on when the bar that we wanted to film in was available. It was not something planned. It's not advisable to film like one of your hardest emotional scenes <laughs> as your very first scene. When you're, it's your first film that you're directing to. It's like not, nobody would ever tell you that's a good idea. But um it ended up great because I felt we filmed that the first half of the day and then we filmed their final goodbye at the beach for the second half of that first day. And I felt like we had made the whole movie in the first day of filming. It was just the best day of filming of my whole life. And um, it was really because these two actors came, I mean, all the work we had done and all the years of prep I had done just creating this story and then feeling like it was actually going to translate to something that was going to be visual and readable on screen was just so exciting. Uh, it must have been a challenge with the production designer because it, you know, you, your set was perfect. It was a typical perfect teenage girl, but her, she has artwork doing that the movie, developing her character. So what was the process of trying to like, you know, define her character through even the, her room? The very first person I hired to the film was my animator, Sara Gunas' daughter. And she um, she did all of the animation by hand for the, for the film. And um, 
which is crazy. If anyone knows anything about animation, like one person doing all the animation that's in this movie is actually insane. Um, but we had no money <laughs> and she, um, she was just incredible and she understood the sensibility. So not only did she do all the animation, but she did all of Minnie's artwork. So all of her artwork in her binder, in her notebook that's hers, all of the artwork on the walls, a lot of the artwork on the walls was prepared because we knew how it was going to transition into animation. So she was, I, th I think Sarah was on maybe a year and a half before we started filming. And we started planning and prepping and working on the animation before anything else. And then my incredible production designer, Jonah, and I and Sarah really wanted to make her room feel like a real teenage girl's room because that's another thing I just never buy in movies. Like teenage girl's room doesn't look like a real teenage girl's room. So um, we wanted it to feel really lived in and really her. And um, the artwork was a huge part of that, but that's all Sarah. I did, uh, we, I, one of the favorite scenes as soon as I were talking about was the pool house scene. Minnie had some expectations of the cute boy, but reality sets in when he's not so skilled at sex with his selfish behavior, prioritizing his pleasure over hers. She shows agency by taking charge. Why was yeah. it important to, sh to you to show her taking control here instead of perhaps a scene with Monroe? I feel like every girl I know at some point will like share a story about being young, about the moment we got shamed by some guy who told us we were too much or who made us feel like we were, something was wrong with us. And it's something I just realized like I had never really seen in a movie. It also, it felt like this big defining thing for her too, to feel, to feel like she thought she was, something was wrong with her because of her sexual desires. And I think it's a really relatable thing. Um, and that's the moment where it sort of shifts, where she takes control and then he later kind of shames her and tells her like she scared him. Um, so it really came out of something in the book and that moment where he says he, that, which was in the book where he says that she scares him. His, she's just so, I can't remember the word. She's just so intense. And- um, You're just so passionate. You're just so right? passionate. Yeah, there's right. something about having sex with you that scares me, you're just so passionate. Right, you're just so passionate. And I just related to that in such a sad way. And I felt like so many girls I know related to that feeling shamed. And I think that has to do with our weird ideas about sex in our society where we're all told boys are gonna wanna have sex before girls, but really girls mature sexually before boys more often than not. And so often the girl is kind of like, what do you mean? Why aren't we doing more? And the boy's kind of like, I'm scared. But that's not ever a dynamic that's shown. Um, I feel like the messaging I got as a young girl was like, you never have to have sex when, if you don't want to. Um, boys are going to try to pressure you. You get to say no. You have agency over your own body. And nobody ever told me what would happen if I wanted to have sex before a guy wanted to have sex. <laughs> nobody wanted told me what would happen if, um, you know, boys were not ready. And my husband talks about that too, of being like, having these ideas that men are supposed to be this way and then being like kind of really scared about a lot of things that were happening around him and doing things despite feeling really scared. And um, I don't know, all those feelings wrapped up into that. Like I could feel for that boy in that way and I can feel for her in that way too of being shamed. And um, I mean, it was also just a great moment to kind of show in a movie of like this girl being like, let me show you how it's done and kind of rolling him over. <laughs> uh, just there's something incredibly satisfying about it too. It was something and, very dramatically though, because when Minnie is shamed and Ricky buys in a car, she, it turns into animated sequence, which becomes a sad giant and crying. So it was a good way of using animation to kind of. Well, yeah. And that was a sequence in the book that I had always loved, which was this, and it was based on Phoebe's 
truly what she calls her first cartoon, which wasn't related to the Ricky thing in the book, I don't think. I think it was just her first cartoon was her as a giant walking around the city. And I decided to try to figure out how to connect that to this story of this boy and Ricky and why would she draw this cartoon, which she has in the book, the real cartoon she drew when she was 15. And it's her with these big thighs and hairy legs stomping through the city. And I remember that feeling as you're going through puberty and hair is sprouting and you feel disgusting and you're like, what's wrong with me? And I tried to think through like, with all the animation in the movie, what's the emotional impetus for it? So how could this story, how could this part of her story of this boy who she's having sex with that makes her feel so bad about herself lead to that animation? And then we took her original comic that she drew and really animated it really, it's really, true to Phoebe's original animation. But that kind of storytelling was me taking bits of this and bits of that and trying to figure out how to connect it. Now, we also have some comedy and humor to talk about. Uh, Charlotte behaves like a semi-responsible mom, cleaning the house and making dinner. Of course, this is all high on cocaine. <laughs> how did you approach this thing with Kirsten Wig, Kirsten Wig on this one? To, uh... I mean, we just had too much fun with that on coke cleaning house scene. It was just ridiculously fun we had and she did so many funny takes where she like there's one scene where she like bursts into Mitney's room and she's like I'm making pasta what do you want <laughs> what's your favorite kind of pasta we had like a million funny um just different lines that she did for that I mean she's too funny sometimes I was like okay that's too funny that's comedian funny we needed to be a little more real just um regular person funny but uh we just had the best time, like the whole kind of montage of them cleaning the house when they're on Coke. And that was a line from the book that just made me giggle. Like my mom got some Coke and she and her friend cleaned the house all day. I just found that so funny. The, uh, there was also that really, I thought sweet scene in the boat, uh, where, but we're beginning- Second day. To, second day, <laughs> you're, just, you're, you're just piling all the tough scenes in the beginning. The uh, so the boat scene, Monroe is beginning to look at Minnie as like a future. Yeah. It also sets up her like, oh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, so how did you approach this boat sequence? And the, the other question <laughs> is, how did the DP, your director of photography, feel about shooting in a very tight, tiny space? My wonderful DP, Brandon, was such a good sport because that boat was really small and it was really, really, really hard to film. Those were certain things that I just didn't totally get before I made a movie. Like, it'll be fine. We can have a whole six page scene in a boat. And then realizing how hard that is. And like where they run around and wrestle each other. I don't know, it's really complicated. Um, but he was never a problem and just such a joy and made it all work. Um, yeah, that scene, you know, there's a lot of scenes where the turning points in the script are happening emotionally and not physically. Nothing, there's not a plot change like that something happens and now the trajectory of the story is changing. The trajectory of the story was always emotional. So it was him falling more in love with her and her falling less in love with him or her being needy and him pu pulling away you know it was it was these sort of emotional turning points and that boat scene was always so important and that was something that was in the book really clearly it was a comic in the book that I felt really connected to and how do we it was exactly that what you said that he starts to see a future with her and then she's kind of like ooh, ooh, oh uh, she feels so complicated about that idea that they could play house and pretend and they're in this little boat that has a little kitchen and they could pretend there's a cat and they could think about what their future might be like and um it's so enticing and complicated and uh and also there's something so sad about the fact that he's looking at boats and can't afford a boat. 
and there's something about it that makes you recognize that he's not totally who he wants to be or who he thinks he is. And I don't know, the, all of it just had a wonderful patheticness to it that I really connected to and loved. Well, you kind of pay it off in the acid scene, which actually was very funny, but it ends with, you know, he was afraid and weak. I finally got what I wanted from Monroe and I had no desire for it. How did you approach the acid scene, which was really great and funny, but it was also the emotionally big climax of their relationship. That was the scene I rewrote the most out of the whole movie. Um, because I often feel like drug scenes are done in a way that I don't like in movies. They're usually, well, they're often at least nowadays done for humor, mm. which this one was too, but like not in a realistic way. So how to have an acid scene or drug trip scene where the emotional turning point that happens actually affects the larger storyline. She really does fall out of love with him while they're on acid. And she really does have this moment where he becomes, he's able to finally say, I love you in for the first time when they're on acid. And she's like, no, I do not want this. And, and it has to stick. So whatever happens, it can't be so funny or silly that it's not going to, it's not going to stay as the emotional truth afterwards and be like erased from memory. It has to be uh, real enough. And then I also, I also wanted it to feel like what it really feels like to be on drugs. Um, not that I know. <laughs> um, but so the trick of it which I worked out at the Sundance Labs. I filmed that scene at the Sundance Director's Lab and I, it was the scene I kind of screwed up the most when I was there and learned the most from because I tried to be in both of their perspectives. There were versions of the script where I tried to be in both perspectives, like her trip and his trip. And he, and he had this whole trip where he was sort of like in Vietnam. Or she was having this good trip, he was having this bad trip. And then I realized, no, I, I can never leave her perspective. This movie is her perspective. We are in her head. We are not, that is such a hard and fast rule of this movie. And I can't break it just because it's fun to break it in this scene. So cluing back into her trip and realizing she was having this ascension where she's becoming a bird and she's finding lightness and she's growing and she's becoming more of who she is. And then he's like pulling her down and she's realizing like, he's interrupting her great trip with like his, and he's literally trying to bring her down to the floor. And she's like, no, oh, I'm trying to fly. And he's like trying to bring her down. It was a little on the nose maybe, but when I say it now, I'm like, hmm. but you know, I was trying to kind of have that thing that when you're a teenager and you do drugs and you look back at something, you're like, that's the real the moment I realized I needed to fly away. And it's real, you know, um, that she's, that there's a real realization that happens for her in that moment, which is like, I'm a bird flying away and he's an old man who's trying to drag me down into the pit. And like, I have a full life ahead of me and I don't need, I don't need to be in the mud with him. Um, and Alexander Skarsgård was just so good in that scene. My parents were on set that day and they were like, we joked that they were the acid uh, consultants who were like giving everybody like, okay, well, here's what it's like to be on acid for both Alex and Bell. And, um, and he just committed, man. He just, he went to an animal place and it was powerful. Uh, now the emotionally devastating scene is when mom discovers the tapes. Uh, you know, Belle, I mean, Minnie is obviously feeling shame, also needing her mom. There's so many complex emotions going on. What was your approach to working with that scene? Because that's when everything kind of crashed. I mean, the beautiful thing about the book is that the responses of people to these things, the way they were written in the book were so real because they were based on a real story. And you just think like, I could never write that. Like, that's how she responded. That is so human and so, um, so it was about trying to kind of justify a really, really weird response to this 
realization, you know, th that her mother's response was like, well, then you're going to get married. Yeah, no, that, that was. Uh... Uh, so like, how do we get there? <laughs> Cause that's such a, it's such a tough thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, all I can say is it was also these actors just being so present in all of the complex pain that was going into that moment, finally being discovered. And a lot of it was about through the process of making these tapes and trying to imbue them with so much secrecy and care so that by the time you find this thing, you've really tracked it, you've tracked it throughout the script, you've tracked her hiding it, you've tracked what it means, you've tracked what the tapes mean, you've tracked where she keeps them, you've followed her secrecy. And so that when they are, when she walks in to see them discovered, you feel what you would feel if you were a teenager and you saw your mother reading your diary, you know, that like, oh God, that was my biggest hope was that the audience would go <gasps> and, the first time we showed it to an audience, that was the exact rea reaction and it made me realize it was working. I mean, I, I like the end where she, the mom does sort of become a better mom. Like she she looks for her daughter, but can never fully like, but you don't ask, don't tell, we never speak of it again, which, you know, was a creepy. How do you want that? Could you want to show that she was a little bit better, but could not be, no one's going to change that much. Exactly. That was exactly it. I think a lot of people who read the script wanted there to be a bigger change with everybody. And it was like, no, we've got to stay real. This is humans and they don't change entirely, but they can grow incrementally. And I, I believed and loved these characters and believed that they moved the needle and grew from this experience. And I wanted there to be that hope there, but not an unrealistic hope, not a feeling that like, and now suddenly everything's fine, which I just don't think is real. I was also impressed at the end, like when she, when she runs away, you didn't shy away from the dark side. She was getting heavy into drugs, which was definitely in the book. Was that something where you just like, I want to go there and not kind of yeah. shy away from it? For sure. And there were moments, there were versions of the script where it was even darker. There were, I remember there being conversations where people along the way were like, I don't want to see a needle going into an arm. Mm -hmm. And I think we ended up doing it in animation because there were, everyone has their own comfort level with how dark that went, but it goes pretty dark. I mean, with Tabitha, it's a pretty, and in the book, it's a pretty big section and it, and it goes pretty, pretty dark. And it, I pulled back on some of it from where it goes in the book. The book is heavier. The book is also so much longer. Like I couldn't, couldn't put everything that was in the book into the movie. There was just no way. Um, but yeah, that was a section that I fought to keep dark and it's still not as dark as the book. I just love the actual end shot of Belle after she, she t tells Monroe I'm better than you, you son of a bitch. Uh, the end shot of just her dancing like a teenage girl back in her room. Me kind of. too. <laughs> it was like, it, to me, it was priceless because we've been through a very tough journey, especially in you know, act three with the drugs. So I thought that was kind of the perfect. It was always important to me that at, at the end of the day, this was Minnie's story and that she gets to survive and she gets to thrive and you get to love her and she you get to feel her because that's my feeling about Phoebe. That was my feeling about Minnie from the book. That was my feeling when I finished the book was this feeling of like, I'm so impressed with this girl. And I find her inspiring and I find her, I love her. And I feel like she, and we often tell these stories of these sexual coming of ages of girls where they get kind of punished in it. And I didn't want that to be what we were getting from this. I didn't want like, if you have a sexual appetite, you get punished. I wanted it to be like, no, this is someone who's working it out and she's, She's going to be okay. And she is also an artist. And I think part of why you feel like she'll survive is because she has her art as a coping mechanism and as a way of processing. But um, it was so important to me that we end realizing she's learned even a little bit about herself. Yeah. And let's be honest, like boys are never punished in movies. No. Especially the behavior. So it's like, and it wasn't even misbehavior. She was natural. It was natural. So yeah. Uh, all right, we're about to open up to the few audience questions, but I, I do have to ask about one other piece of work of yours. 
uh, before we get there, uh, our alum, Scott Frank, who is a huge supporter of Script to Screen, helped develop it, and he really supports a whole entire screenwriting program here at UCSB Film Media Studies. He wrote and produced and directed The Queen's Gambit. He casted you as Alma, which I would contend was a better mom than Charlotte, but Alma still had her own <laughs> life and her own desires and her own things. What drew you to that role and made you want to play the character? She is kind of weirdly like Charlotte in a funny way. I mean, not the best mom and has addictive substance problems. And uh, Scott and I are friends because of the Sundance Labs. He was an advisor on Diary early on and um, we stayed friends. And I played a really tiny part in his movie, A Walk Among the Tombstones, that I got cut out of, which as I was filming it, I was like, this is going to be cut out. But I wasn't really acting at the time. It was more just like a fun favor to do, kind of. And after that, he was he was like, oh, but you're actually a good actor. I didn't know that. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to make you do something. And then he's been trying to get me to act for many, many years since then, but I'm always busy. He wanted me to be in Godless, but I was making Can You Ever Forgive Me? And so when this came around, I was going to play a smaller part in The Queen's Gambit. And I said yes to like five days. Okay, yeah, I can come do this part for like five days. That's reasonable for my life. I'm a mom. I'm directing a lot of things. I can't go off and do your thing for six months. It's not my project. And then a few months before we started filming, the actor who was going to play Alma dropped out and he called me and asked me to play the part. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about, Scott? I don't, nobody can even see my acting. I was like a theater actor 10 years ago. Netflix isn't going to let you give me one of these lead parts of your series. Like, that's crazy. I know how casting works. Like, no, that's not going to happen. And he was like, well... Tell me if you're actually interested and then let me deal with Netflix. I'll go back to them. And I was like, really scared. I was weirdly just like so scared. And then I said, yes. And he went like the next day, he was like, Netflix said it was fine. I was like, what? <laughs> so then I had to do it. Um, and it was a total joy. It was so fun. And it was so fun not being in charge. It was just like a really, really, a huge relief to look around at everything and be like, I just have this one job to do on this set. And it's a hard job, but it's only one job. <laughs> and I'm not in charge of all of these 200 people. And I can come to set a lot of times I only work two days a week. It was great. So we're gonna bring my uh, student producer, uh, Gina, to the screen. She has a few questions for you from the audience. Hi, Gina. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. My housemates and I loved watching the, the movie. Um, so our first question from the audience is from one of our interns in the program. Um, she says, Charlotte likes to consider herself a feminist, it seems, but when it comes to Minnie, she tells her to dress cute or wear a skirt once in a while. What was the purpose of having this contrast in her character and do you think it affected my, um, Minnie's sexual journey? 100% affected Minnie's sexual journey, I think. I talked to my mom and my stepmom or my mom and my mother-in-law a lot about what it was like being a feminist in the Bay Area at that time. And they talked about like these women that they thought of as sort of fake feminists back then. My mother-in-law said something about actually kind of not buying Patty Hearst back then and kind of thinking she was full of um, and I was like, oh, this is so fascinating. Like this is a sort of rift within the women's rights movement that I wouldn't have known about. I wasn't alive then. I didn't know what the sort of prevailing theories going in the moment were, but um, I sort of viewed Charlotte as a bit of a wannabe feminist who wasn't fully walking the walk, but but she wanted to, <laughs> like she had, she was just a walking dichotomy. She had the, she had some of the rhetoric down, but she couldn't shed her past. She couldn't shed the messaging she had been given by her own mom and her own grandmother about look pretty and wear a skirt and this and that. And that's just like ingrained in her. And that's not her fault. That's the patriarchy talking through her. But um, I kind of loved playing with Charlotte as, and I used the Patty Hearst trial to try to show this weird little, there's a scene that I think is really clunkily written by me in the beginning of where the girls 
Charlotte and her two daughters are talking about Patty Hearst and they're all taking different sides about whether they blame her or not. And that was my attempt at kind of showing that um, division that was sort of there amongst feminists. One more question too. Yeah, so um, we always end our Q&As with the same question because we're an academic institution. We'd like you to be professor for a moment. Um, if you were to assign a movie for students to watch to study screenwriting or directing, which would it be? I always feel like I'm going to fail when I get a question like this. Hmm. There are no wrong answers. <laughs> I mean, Harold and Maude comes to mind right away just because I think it's one of the best movies ever. And it works for me every time I see it, it just continues to work for me from a screenwriting point of view, but from a directing point of view, from a performance point of view, from a music point of view, such a cohesive project. And I just love that movie so much. And it's so weird, but it doesn't feel that weird when you watch it. Um, yeah, Harold and Mott. Uh, well, I'd like to invite our two other student producers this screen, Ellie and Sonia. Uh, this is our 10th, uh, you know, this, I realize it's our 10th anniversary of Script to Screen. I uh, wanted to give a special thanks to the student team. Uh, they really helped put this event together. They really worked a long time researching the Q&A and I'm grateful. And they've also done all the events for the last 10 years with, with some of our alums. So thank you guys for helping with this one and all the other events. And I want to thank, of course, our guests today, taking the time out for joining us in a very unfiltered mini-like way in your boldness and talking about what happened during this wonderful film, making this wonderful film. And of course, we want you in person in Santa Barbara when the world is allowed and we love- Oh, I would program. really love, love to be in Santa Barbara and getting to go have a drink with my friends in Santa Barbara after I come to you guys. I just, it sounds delightful. Thanks so much for coming and thank the audience and thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks.